All right, yes. So I'll be talking about uh, comparative primate genomics. Um, and I think it's important just to, to start out by saying, uh, telling you why I think it's important that we study uh, primate genomics. We can analyze fundamental questions of primate biology. And as, as Sarah mentioned, my background is really in anthropology, not in, in medicine. So I'm interested in primate biology for a whole variety of different reasons. Um, but we also investigate the fundamentals of human biology through uh, what I hope are informed cross-species comparisons. And uh, a lot of our work in the last uh, few years has been related to human health and disease. So we help to identify causes of diseases and the pathobiology, understanding the pathobiology of those human diseases. And eventually we want to exploit the, the primates to help develop therapies. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of different examples of, of developing therapies. So there was a time a number of years ago where I used to think that um, there were really two different branches of primate genetics. There was on the one hand, understanding fundamental primate biology, and then a kind of a separate topic was using primates to understand human health and disease. But I think as we've, we've learned more and more about the genetics and the genomics, we're really merging these two fields. And I hope to show you with a couple of different examples, especially in my, my last example at the end, how understanding primate biology really is a tool for understanding human health and disease. So right to begin, I want to thank the people at the Human Genome Sequencing Center of Baylor College of Medicine. Most of the work that I'm going to talk about has been done here at the Genome Center, and I really depend on the, the expert uh, production people, sequencing people um, at the Genome Center. Two other absolutely critical people that I need to thank right away are shown at the right, Alan Harris, Dr. Alan Harris and Dr. Muthaswamy Raviendran, two senior people in my group. And, and really, when I say we did something or we analyzed something, I hope you'll all understand that I kind of uh, set the, the goals, and it's really Alan and Ravi who do all, all the analyses, all the hands-on work. So in terms of fundamental primate biology, the first step, of course, is to develop high-quality reference genomes for the primates that we want to study. And we've done a lot of that at the, at the Genome Center here at Baylor. Uh, this is just a list of the various different primate species for which we've either produced a reference genome sequence ourselves or contributed and collaborated with other groups developing those reference sequences. And of course, that's, that's the high quality, as complete as possible reference genome that we use as the standard for that species. And then all other comparisons are against that reference genome. The species I'm going to talk about for most of the of the presentation, although not, not entirely all of it, um, is the rhesus macaque. This is because rhesus are the most widely used non-human primate in biomedical research in the US, and I believe rhesus are the most widely used in, in the UK as well. So uh, we know much more about the genetics and genomics of rhesus macaques than we do other primates, although some of the other ones are, are catching up. And what you can see on the right here is that rhesus are an, a highly successful primate species distributed all the way from northern Pakistan in the west, all the way across northern India, uh, Thailand, Laos, all the way to the Pacific coast of, of China. So rhesus are highly adaptable, and that's probably one of the reasons why they do well in laboratory settings. So a couple of years ago, we published the, the most recent uh, upgraded reference genome for the rhesus macaque. This was a work we did in collaboration with Wes Warren, who's at Missouri, and, and Evan Eichler in, in Seattle and Washington. Um, it was Wes and, and Evan who did the assembly of the, of the rhesus genome. We contributed a bit of data, but they actually assembled the, the new rhesus genome. What we did was contribute whole genome sequence data for 853 rhesus macaques. And we collected those DNA samples from this list of primate centers across the US. So we've, we've really tried to survey all of the major primate research institutions at the, across the US that use rhesus macaques and collected a sample of about 853 whole genome sequences. Now we've increased this. And in fact, we're, we're currently analyzing a data set of 2000 rhesus monkeys, but that data are, those data are not yet fully analyzed. So I'm not gonna be able to talk about those data um, today. But 853 is by far the largest sample size for 
polymorphism within any non-human primate species. And this is just some of the statistics. I'm gonna see if I can pull up a pointer here. Yeah, so, so across these 853 individuals, we found more than 85 million single nucleotide variants. So there's a great deal of genetic variation within these captive rhesus monkeys. And what you can see is that when we look at missense variation or, or mutations that change an amino acid in a protein coding gene, there's more than 400,000. So there's a tremendous amount of functionally interesting genetic variation that's segregating in these rhesus populations. Just by way of comparison, to put those numbers into context, so we've got our 853 rhesus monkeys here with a total of 85 million variants. This is a paper from a couple of years ago, but it's one of the largest papers published to date where the people sequenced 929 uh, humans, pe uh, people from 54 different global populations. These 929 people were selected to be as, as ethnically and genetically diverse as possible. And what you can see is that collectively, those 929 people had 67 million single nucleotide variants, whereas our 800 rhesus monkeys had about 25% higher. So the rhesus monkeys, even the captive rhesus monkeys in research populations have higher levels of genetic variation than do the most diverse global populations of people. Now, um, I'm not a part of the MGAP uh, system, but I wanna point you all to, to MGAP, which is uh, housed at or maintained and developed at the Oregon Primate Center. And it's a really a repository for whole genome and exome sequences for rhesus macaques. And it can be a, a very useful resource for people who are looking to survey genetic variation in monkeys. We contribute our data to MGAP and other people who are also sequencing macaques contribute data. So now a couple of examples. And I wanna start with an example from, from cancer, uh, understanding that all of you are primarily interested in neuroscience, but I, this is an example I'd like to start with. Um, related to Lynch syndrome. And I don't know how many of you are, are gonna be familiar with Lynch syndrome, but this is one of the most common hereditary cancers in humans. Some very uh, smart and very um, uh, perceptive veterinarians at, at a research colony in the US identified what they believed was a spontaneously occurring macaque model of Lynch syndrome. So this is, uh, Stanton Gray and, and Beth Dre, Christian Aby, um, who first identified families of monkeys that seemed to be showing colorectal cancer uh, that was very similar histologically to Lynch syndrome cancers and people. Now, the background is that Lynch syndrome in humans is caused by mutations in one of four specific genes, MSH2, MLH1, MSH6 and PSM2. And these are all, these four genes are all DNA mismatch repair genes. So these are critical to DNA repair as cells divide in, in the human body. What happens is that if people inherit one mutated copy of one of these four genes, they are at much elevated risk for colorectal cancer. And the reason is that the endothelium of your intestines is a very rapidly dividing tissue. It turns over, um, cells replicate very quickly so that there's a high turnover and a high potential for a second hit somatic mutation that would wipe out the second copy of that uh, same gene. And when people get a second hit mutation, that then they can no longer produce one of these critical four DNA mismatch repair proteins. And that means that that cell lineage then is highly susceptible to, uh, to cancer-causing mutations. Many of the cell lineages will go on to cause cancer. That's the, the underlying basis of, of Lynch syndrome in people. So what, what Stanton and, and Beth and Christian did is send us samples from their rhesus monkeys that had colorectal cancer. We sequenced those animals. And what we found is that there were specific monkeys that had mutations in two of the different uh, Lynch syndrome genes from, from humans. So there were seven out of the 24 cases that had mutations in MSH6, and six of them had a stop gain mutation in MLH1. 
The CAD scores on these mutations are very high. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with CAD scores, but CAD scores are basically a bioinformatic tool for integrating information, a whole variety of different types of information to predict whether a particular mutation, if it occurred in the human genome, would likely have a significant functional effect on that protein. CAD scores of 20 mean that that particular mutation would be in the 1% most significant, most functionally significant if it occurred in the human genome. And a CAD score of 30 means it would be in the 0.1% most functionally significant. So a CAD score of 22 is a very high CAD score and a CAD score of 36 means that this mutation is almost certainly pathogenic. We then compared the, the allele frequencies in, the, in these affected animals with a, a set of controls, about 600 controls from the same pedigrees, the same colony of, of rhesus monkeys. And what you can see is that both the MSH6 uh, missense mutation and the stop codon on MLH1 are significantly elevated in the, in the affected animals relative to the controls. So clearly what we have is a situation where you have spontaneous naturally occurring mutations in Lynch syndrome genes, but in these rhesus macaques, and that's driving cancers, colorectal cancer in the macaques. What's also interesting is that the tumors are very similar, essentially identical to the tumors in, in humans. But various researchers have tried for a number of years to develop knockout mice, to develop a mouse model of Lynch syndrome, and they have not been successful. The knockout mice don't recapitulate the same kinds of tumors in the same places in the colon and with the same kind of histology that, that human Lynch syndrome patients show. So what we have is a spontaneous macaque model of colorectal cancer. In fact, I think it's fair to say that this isn't a model of Lynch syndrome, but in fact, the monkeys actually have Lynch syndrome. They have mutations, damaging mutations in the same genes that cause Lynch syndrome in people. Attempts to, to develop mouse models have not been successful. And that points to the, the, the specific value of, of primate models for, for, uh, for modeling and for studying human disease. Now we've taken this a step further and we've just recently been awarded a grant with Eduardo Villar, who's at, at the MD Entrance and Cancer Center, to, to develop therapies, to test novel therapies using these Lynch syndrome monkeys. And basically what happens is that when, when a person with Lynch syndrome develops their tumor, they're obviously developing mutations um, that cause the cancer, that, that cause the carcinogenesis itself. But they also are susceptible to mutations in other genes elsewhere in the genome. And one of the types of genes that's highly susceptible to mutations is genes that have um, internal microsatellites, dinucleotide repeats or trinucleotide repeats within the coding sequence of the gene. Those are highly susceptible to frame shift mutations. When, of course, when a frame shift mutation occurs in any protein that expressed, that's expressed in one of these um, colon cells, that shifts the amino acid sequence downstream of the mutation, and it causes what we call a neoantigen. So the protein sequence that's expressed is quite different from the protein sequence um, of the native protein. What, we, what cancer biologists want to do is develop a method of, of priming the immune system of people who are susceptible to Lynch syndrome cancers, prime them for these neoantigens so that when those neoantigens develop, their immune system would attack the tumor and, and hopefully uh, restrict the tumor. So we're gonna be developing neoantigen immunogenicity in the, in the macaques and testing this strategy in the macaques. I hope that's clear. And if anybody has any questions about that, um, you could stop me now and ask if you like, because I'm gonna go on to a different, a different disease. Nope, all right. Um, the second example I want to talk about is retinal diseases, and, and this is, you know, a bit closer to neuroscience, but um, uh, I think it's also an interesting example of, of the power of, of spontaneous polymorphisms in non-human primates for developing disease models. And this is work that was started at the California Primate Center, where I have very close collaborations. The work started actually when a couple of really smart, very perceptive animal care staff identified two young animals that behaved very unusually. And what the story 
story goes is that that these young juveniles, they were about two years old at the time. They had been raised all their lives in these outdoor corrals with, you know, 50, 60, 80 uh, monkeys in a corral. That's where most of the monkeys in California are raised. But these animals had been assigned to a new research project. So they were moved indoors to, to this kind of enclosure. And when they were moved indoors, they didn't behave like normal juveniles would in that situation, jumping around and climbing on them on the walls and, and, and running around playing. They, in fact, I mean, you can't see me, um, but they, in fact, walked very slowly around the cage, feeling the walls of the cage. They were very reluctant to jump to the platforms and, and jump down from the platforms. And the, the animal care staff recognized there was something different about these animals, likely something about their vision. Now, I'll just remind you that, that in the human retina, the same as in the rhesus macaque retina, we have two kinds of photoreceptors. On the periphery of our retina, and it's throughout the retina, but mostly on the periphery, we have rod photoreceptors that we use for peripheral vision and for night vision. The cone photoreceptors are the second type of, of photoreceptor, and those are the photoreceptors we use for fine uh, vision, for reading, for color vision. And those cone photoreceptors are concentrated at the back of the retina in a, an area called the macula. So we have cone photoreceptors distributed throughout the retina, but especially important in the macula for fine, uh, fine vision and, and rod photoreceptors around the, the periphery. So Sarah Thomasy, who is a veterinary ophthalmologist, I actually didn't know before I started this project, there was such a thing as a veterinary ophthalmologist, but there are, and Sarah is an outstanding one. She did what's called an electroretinography to test the function of their cone and rod photoreceptors of these affected animals. And what she found was that the rod photoreceptors were normal in these animals, but the cone photoreceptors showed absolutely no response to the flash of light. So there's essentially no function in the cone photoreceptors relative to the control animal. We looked at the pedigree and the, the first two animals were closely related. And we actually found two additional animals once the project started that were also closely related to these animals. So obviously if you have a, have a disease, disorder like this and it seems to be running in families, we do whole genome sequencing. And what we found is that all of the affected animals were all homozygous for a mutation that changes a single amino acid in an enzyme called PDE6C or phosphodiesterase 6C. That amino acid change is actually in the catalytic domain of this enzyme. And it essentially eliminates enzymatic function of this enzyme. So it's a, essentially a knockout, spontaneous knockout mutation of this enzyme. This enzyme is known to cause a disease in people, which is called achromatopsia. And it's a cone specific photoreceptor deficiency. These people have very poor vision. They're not totally blind, but they have very poor vision because they have no functioning cone photoreceptors. So the whole picture made a great deal of sense. The, the electroretinography showed that the, the monkeys had no cone photoreceptor function and normal rod photoreceptor function. And the mutation hits a gene which is expressed only in cone photoreceptors. So we then began working with Tim Stout, who's the chairman of, of ophthalmology at, at Baylor. And Tim developed an adenovirus associated vector that carries the rhesus macaque normal copy of PDE6C. And Sarah and, and her staff injected that uh, gene therapy vector into the subretinal space of affected rhesus monkeys. And we've now been following these rhesus monkeys for a number of weeks, up, up to um, about six months. And the, the injected eye shows recovered pho cone photoreceptor function, whereas the, the eye that, uh, from the same animal that was not injected with the, with the gene therapy vector doesn't show any, any uh, recovery. So we've got two examples of naturally occurring spontaneous mutations in monkeys that, that clearly should have downstream disease consequences. And what you can see, you know, to go back to the numbers, there's literally thousands of these kinds of mutations potentially segregating in, in 
rhesus macaques. Now, not all of these missense mutations are going to cause disease. Obviously, many of them will be benign, but a significant fraction of them are going to be interesting. And what this is showing you is, is likely gene damaging SNPs. Likely gene damaging SNPs constitute, again, thousands of potential mutations in these monkey populations. So now, uh, finally, some neuroscience. Let's get to the neuroscience. I've been working for a number of years with the uh, chairman of, of psychiatry up at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and his name is, is Ned Kalin. Ned is a clinical psychiatrist. He treats children with anxiety disorders and severe um, depression. What Ned has done over the last uh, um, many years, a number of years, is develop a monkey model for severe behavioral inhibition and anxiety disorders, uh, especially among young rhesus monkeys. So what Ned does is, is the monkeys are raised in normal social groups with their mothers. So it's not a kind of uh, abnormal developmental environment. But when the animals are between a year and a half and three and a half or four years of age, so they're they're weaned, um, but they're not, they're prepubital. So they're, they're young, they're equivalent to, to children of the ages of, of four to, to eight or nine years old. He removes the animal from its home social cage uh, and puts it in a, in a single cage all by itself in a room that that animal has never been in before. That by itself is mildly stressful for the animal. And the responses of the animals are very characteristic. They begin to produce a, a call, what we call a lost call or a coo call, which is um, basically the call of, the, of an infant calling back to its mother saying, I'm lost, I'm frightened, please come get me, please come, um, come find me. It's obviously a, a natural uh, behavior that would, animals in the wild would, would um, express. But then after a few minutes um, of acclimating to the, um, to the single cage alone, a person comes into the room and stands about six feet away from the cage, doesn't stare right at the animal because that would be highly threatening, but just stands in profile. And we call this the no eye contact condition. So the person is not making eye contact with the animal, but the animals have a very characteristic response to the person coming into the room. And that is they stop calling, they stop moving around, they get quiet, they go to the bottom of the cage and they get very quiet and very, very um, still. And this is obviously an anti-predator defense. If you're lost, if you're a young defenseless animal and you're lost from your social group, a, a potentially threatening individual comes into your neighborhood, you're not gonna continue making noise and moving around, you're gonna get quiet and you're gonna get still. What's very interesting, what Ned showed a number of years ago, is that most of the monkeys stay frozen, stay still and quiet for a few seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and then they break out of that and they go back to moving around and, and, and vocalizing. And we don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but it's, it's pretty easy to conclude that the animal has decided, well, this person is a little bit scary, but, but not really threatening, and I'm going to go back to trying to call my social group members. The really interesting thing is that a small proportion of animals stay frozen much longer. Some of them stay frozen four or five minutes, and some of them stay frozen for much longer than that, 15, 20 minutes. Those monkeys that stay frozen for a long period of time show physiological and neurological similarities to children who show extreme behavioral inhibition. And I'm sure to this audience, I, I, um, you can understand that there are psychiatric conditions where children have extreme behavioral inhibition and, and are much higher risk for adult or, or adolescent anxiety. So this is what Ned is trying to, to study. We started working with Ned a couple, a few years ago, actually a number of years ago, to do the genetics of this, to try to ask whether there's a genetic predisposition to this freezing behavior of the monkeys, the, the duration at which they freeze. And we, we studied a pedigree of, of about 400 animals and showed that the freezing duration was indeed heritable. About one third of the variation in the length at which an animal freezes is attributable to genetic differences among the animals. Now, Ned has also developed a, a composite measurement of what he calls anxious temperament, which includes the duration of freezing, the level of cortisol in the blood, and a couple of other measures. So we're going to use composite anxious temperament as our phenotype here. But it's, you could sort of think of it as the, 
as the freezing behavior. The freezing behavior is one uh, is the major component of it. So we wanted to, we we showed that the that anxious temperament in the monkeys was heritable. We wanted to dig deeper and look at the, the underlying neurobiology. So so Ned did flo um, FDG PET imaging of the monkeys to to look and see what neural circuits were most active in the monkeys that showed extreme behavioral inhibition. So of course, what we do, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this with this kind of protocol, we, we inject the animal with the fluorodeoxyglucose. And during the uptake period, the animal is got put through the, the human intruder test, the, the test in the single cage with the strange person coming into the room. And that is gonna allow the FDG PET imaging to tell us what neural circuits are most active and what are variable across the animals that show different levels of, of anxiety. What Ned was able to show is that the anxious temperament here on the horizontal axis is positively correlated with the FTG uptake, both in the dorsal amygdala and the, in the anterior hippocampus. And of course, you'll all recognize that these are um, two parts of the of the uh, limbic system that, that are quite natural as, as part of the uh, anxiety-related circuitry. We expanded this data set to, to a much larger set of animals and, and we're able to show that in addition to the anterior hippocampus and the, the central amygdala, uh, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis also show heritability and other, other regions of the brain also show heritability in terms of the level of, of FDG uptake it, during the, the human intruder test. Now, there's a number of different genes that were potential candidate genes for uh, controlling this heritability. Uh, we looked first at, at the corticotropin releasing hormone family of genes, and, and especially a corticotropin releasing hormone receptor one. We sequenced uh, that gene in hundreds of monkeys and found a number of these different polymorphisms, some of them. Uh, upstream of the gene and some of them uh, in amino acid sequences. We then did the association testing. And of course, um, I wouldn't probably wouldn't be talking about this unless we found a significant association between some of these SNPs in CRHR1 and um, our phenotypes of interest. But one of the SNPs we call 4805 shows a significant association with anxious temperament, the CC homozygotes have significantly elevated anxious temperament relative to the other two genotypes. And the same SNP is also associated with anterior hippocampal metabolism, the same genotype elevated uh, metabolism in the hippocampus. There's a second SNP, which we call um, 5043. This is the, the genome coordinates in the, in the rhesus macaque genome, but it's not important um, for this purpose. That SNP is also significantly associated with anxious temperament and significantly associated with hippocampal metabolism. And again, it's the same um, homozygous genotype that's associated with the temperament and with the hippocampal change. What's interesting is that these two SNPs are in a very interesting place in the CRHR1 gene. And some of you may be familiar with this gene, some of you may not, but basically, CRHR1 is expressed in the human brain in a couple of different isoforms. The alpha form of CRHR1 has, has 13 exons. The whole coding sequence of the gene is 14 exons, but the alpha sequence of the, of the protein skips exon six and goes right, splices right from exon five to exon seven. The beta isoform of the gene, of the protein, includes exon six. So, uh, what we found is that the SNP, which is associated with, with anxious temperament, is actually right at the splice site of the exon 5. And we think, we, we don't have data yet to, to demonstrate this, but we think what this SNP is doing is modulating the balance between the alpha form of CRHR1 and the beta form of CRHR1. And of course, the other SNP is in exon 6, which may also um, be, be driving some of this, um, this variation. Furthermore, exon 6 is really interesting in CRHR1. This is the amino acid sequence for exon 5. And this is the amino acid sequence into what is exon 6 in humans and chimpanzees, conserved in gorillas, 
somewhat conserved in macaques and marmosets. But what you can see is that there's basically no conservation of exon six in uh, outside of the primates. So what we have is is a mutation that that is probably altering the expression of a of a exon, which is an evolutionarily relatively new uh, development, relatively uh, unique to primates. Uh, the, whether there is a, a beta version and an, and an alpha version of, of this protein. And some of you actually may be more expert on CRHR1 and its um, evolution and function than I am. But this is the, this is the model that we've, that we've developed. We were very heartened a number of years after we published the macaque data to, to, to see this paper, which was a, a large meta-analysis of, of GWAS studies, um, which showed that CRHR1 is in fact associated with various forms of, of affective disorders in, in, in humans. So we have a monkey model, a spontaneously occurring monkey model based around CRHR1 polymorphisms, and it seems to be replicated in, in human GWAS studies. Um, that's, this is uh, more figures from the same paper that, um, the papers that we've been talking about. We've also extended this work working with, with Drew Fox, who's at the California Primate Center, another um, study of, of anxiety-related behaviors and, and finding additional uh, associations with, with um, another gene um, related to, to primate anxiety. And how are we doing on time? I guess I'm doing all right. So, so what we have is naturally occurring macaque models of human genetic diseases. I've talked to you about the CRHR1 model. I've talked with you about the, the retinal disease model. I haven't talked about our endometriosis model, but this is another case of spontaneous mutations in rhesus macaques. We also are working with researchers at the Wisconsin Primate Center on polycystic ovary syndrome. And there are other people, other laboratories that are also doing this kind of work. So the people up in Oregon have a, a spontaneous model of bardet Weidel syndrome in rhesus macaques. And then there are some other papers. These are older papers prior to the whole genome sequencing approach to this, um, but there are prior uh, precedents for studying single gene disorders in the monkeys. Now, so that's the rhesus macaque story. Clearly lots of functionally interesting variation and lots of potential for disease models. We're now expanding this and we've begun sequencing marmosets. Marmosets are a, a South American monkey, a new world monkey, but they're obviously very important for neuroscience. In the US, there, there's a lot of interest among neuroscientists because their brains are much more lysencephalic than, than rhesus monkey brains. So they're, they're more convenient for, for various kinds of optogenetic studies, but they also have a much shorter lifespan, a much more rapid reproductive rate. So for CRISPR-Cas9 manipulations, marmosets are gonna be very interesting. I'm not so interested in CRISPR-Cas9 genetic engineering of marmosets, but rather in, in discovering spontaneous models of variation. And so we've been sequencing marmosets. We've only sequenced about 84 so far, but what we're finding is significant amounts of, of interesting genetic variation. And this, this PCA plot shows that like with the rhesus macaques, where, where there's overlapping sets of genetic variation among different colonies, but there are unique variants in each of the different colonies, there are unique genetic signatures in each of the marmoset colonies. So this is the Wisconsin marmosets in blue, the, the Southwest co um, colony of marmosets in San Antonio, Texas in, in red, the New England primate center animals, which have now been distributed to other primates, but we, we manage, we, we sort of do the comparisons calling these New England primate um, center marmosets because um, they were bred there and they've been distributed now to other centers. And this, this is another population of marmosets. So there are, there are genetic, recognizable genetic differences. And a comparison of heterozygosity, like I did with the rhesus macaques, shows that all of those four marmoset colonies have higher levels of heterozygosity than do humans. This is the human thousand genomes data where there's Europeans and Asians here and Africans here. So for all of these humans have lower levels of variation than these individual colonies of marmosets. So with the, the little bit of time remaining, I wanna, wanna sort of expand our scope, expand our vision and, and talk about a new project which has not yet been published. So I hope, um, even though we're recording this, I hope um, we can consider this kind of a, 
confidential description. This paper will be coming out soon, um, but it's not yet published. This is a, a consortium we've put together with Lucas Coderna, Thomas Marquez Bonet, who's at Barcelona, and especially Kyle Farr, who's at uh, Illumina Corporation, Illumina Sequencing. And, and we've worked with an international consortium of, of primatologists collecting samples from 233 different primate species. So this is a list of all the people who've contributed samples and contributed analyses. What we've done is sequence 703 individuals from 211 different primate species. We combined those data with some previously published data. So for a total data set of 809 individuals from 233 primate species, 72% of these individuals were wild caught primates. So these represent um, genetic variation that's present in the wild. This graph shows heterozygosity for those different primate species. The, the solid bar here shows the median level of heterozygosity for these across these different primate species, which is about 0.0019 or about 0 0.002. The dashed line is median heterozygosity for people from Africa and the dotted line for people from Asia and Europe. And what you can see is that the vast majority of primate species have higher levels of polymorphism within their populations than do either African or, or um, Europeans or Asians. So it's not just rhesus macaques and it's not just marmosets that have high levels of variation, but it's most of the non-human primates. What Kyle and his team at Illumina have done is take that information and begin to ask questions about whether we can use this naturally occurring genetic variation in wild primates to predict pathogenicity of de novo mutations observed in humans. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ClinVar database, but ClinVar is basically a database in the US that's pulling together information about, about amino acid sequence polymorphisms in humans. And when they score a mutation as two star, it means they have high confidence that either the mutation is pathogenic or it's benign. What, what Kyle did was, was look at the ClinVar variation that's been either scored as pathogenic or benign and compare it to what we observe in, in primates. So the, for the overlap between prim, the non-human primate data and the ClinVar variation shows that about 99% of the variation segregating in non-human primates is actually scored as benign in ClinVar rather than being pathogenic. And we can drill down and look at this in a little bit more detail and compare great apes, which are very closely related to humans, or old world monkeys that are about 25 million years um, divergent from, from humans, or new world monkeys about 35 to 40 million years divergent. In all of those cases, if you look at the variants that are segregating in the, in the primates, 99% of them are scored as benign in, in ClinVar and only about 1% are pathogenic. This does not hold true when we go farther out to mammals or to birds or fish where much more of the variation is, is, um, is mixed. So what Kyle and, and Hong Gao, one of Kyle's um, uh, researchers at, at Illumina did, and I can take no credit for this, but this is, this is Kyle's work and, and Hong's work. They developed a neural network. They trained a neural network on these primate specific variants to train the network to predict whether a, a new mutation in humans would be pathogenic or would be benign. So they used the, the alignments of all these different sequences. They reconstructed the protein structure of, the, of all the various proteins and looked at the position of mutations within the protein structure and, and trained the, the model on known human benign variants and the monkey, the primate data. And what they found was that this system, the primate AI 3D system, outperforms all previous predictive tools. The CAD system that I talked about, the SIFT um, system you may be aware of, or REVEL, whether we're looking at neurodevelopmental disorders and de novo uh, mutations that are pathogenic and neurodevelopmental disorders, or whether we're looking at autism-related disorders, autism-related mutations, this is all data from the UK Biobank and the, and the um, annotated pathogenic mutations from the UK Biobank. Primate AI outperforms 
predictions related to autism-related genes, neurodevelopmental genes, and also cardiovascular-related genes. So the conclusion here is that information about amino acid sequences that are present in non-human primates, essentially amino acid changes that have gone through the filter of natural selection in wild primates, provide new and extremely useful information about what mutations are likely to cause disease in people. And uh, Kyle and, and Hong have this paper now in press. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually skip this because it's, um, I've, I'm, we've got only about 15 minutes left and I wanna leave lots of time for, for questions. If there were time, I would talk about um, another project where we're working on baboons and, and looking at hybridization among different baboon species. But um, the bottom line here is that we're looking at hybridization in baboons because it's gonna tell us something about the function and the evolutionary mechanisms and processes involved in uh, hybridization between modern humans and Neanderthals. But with that, I will uh, close and open things for questions.